Hi everybody, Roy here. We're at Back at Simple. This is probably um, our last show. The sun's out, sun is shining, birds are singing. It's a great day to be alive. So um, I thought, well, what's the best way to end the, end the indoor show? And I, I, it's back to self-assessment. I realized, well, you know, like I started earlier, I realized I'm a gardener, a grower of plants. I garden quite a bit. I enjoy, just enjoy gardening. And I've got all these questions asked of me. And also I read a lot online and talk to other people, workshops and seminars, <clears throat> and said, tremendous degree of interest, not just in gardening, but in all the creatures that live with plants and count on plants to have a lifestyle. Birds, butterflies, um, bees, pollinating insects, there's so much now to gardening. And I have to be fair to myself, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not an ologist of anything. I'm not a biologist. I'm, I'm just a dirt gardener. And that's how I grew up, fortunately learning from the plants. So I thought, instead of me trying to make up answers to all these questions and just mislead people, which would be all the wrong thing to do, and simply agree with everybody just because I don't know, I don't want to agree with. I can't just agree and say, yeah, you're right, yeah, you're right. <clears throat> I said, what can I, what, can I, what can I share this with? So I thought, I'm going to talk to Jerry, Jerry Wilhelm. So I invited him to be on the show. And, you're, and you've met Jerry Wilhelm <clears throat> through some of the other shows I've had. I've shared his book with you. We did a video much earlier, a couple of years ago. But there's no one I know who has a deeper, not just knowledge, but a deeper sense, awareness, and sharing ability than Jerry. To, to help me understand this better, not to create solutions as much, but to understand where I'm going and where all of us are taking our future and what our future holds in store for us when we take actions. So here's Jerry. Hello. And i like first Jerry to share a little bit about who's Jerry Wilhelm. You know, just a little bit, and especially the floor of Chicago, things you've well, when I got out of the Army and I met Ray Schulenberg and Floyd Swink at the Morton Arboretum, I had got myself pretty deep into botany and uh, had been studying plants ever since then, 1974, mm -hmm. and started working on the vascular flora of the Chicago region. And then at the end of the last century, also started working on uh, the lichens of the region. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, well, I had a a landscape architecture engineering company for about 20 years, yeah. but uh, then uh, when I got through with that, I <laughs> uh, we went back to, uh, well actually throughout that, much of that time, for about uh, 20 years, Laura and Rurika and I worked on the floor of the Chicago region, which was an update of previous floors, but actually had a lot on the uh, uh, plant descriptions, mm -hmm. and, and then also on all of the things that grow with the plants including a lot of the insects. Well, I, I brought the book with, so I thought maybe you could share with people just a, a little bit about the book and, and the completeness of it. It has so much knowledge. Well, I'll just open it, uh, just one uh, page. One of the things it has in it, it has uh, an illustration of each genus done by uh, Mary Marguerite Lowther, Marguerite Lowther so, she, so that the student, when they go through the keys, for example, and try to figure out what a plant is, and they get to the right answer, we hope, mm -hmm. then they can get, get to the genus and see that, uh, well, they, their, their Baptisia looks a lot like that. Mm -hmm. And then so, then they go to the species, and they can discover uh, where it grows in the region. Within and the Chicago, how many the counties? Chicago region. How many counties? 22 counties 22. in each region. Okay. And then, uh, and it tells also, we have all of the native species, what we call native plants, that is to say plants that were somewhere, that were in this region prior to settlement. Okay. And that doesn't mean that just because we have a dot in the county uh, that, uh, that that's native to every place in that county. It's just that it's known to be from that county mm -hmm. and having been here aboriginally. And basically it's, a, it, it, it's everything that grows. Everything that grows wild, wild. in the Chicago area. Native and non-native. Native and non-native. Mm -hmm. We have almost a almost a thousand non-native species and about two thousand native species wow. roughly and then it, in in this case of the lead plant for example here you can see that we have all of the vascular plant associates to grow all with the it. relationships the relationships yeah. and yeah. the different habitats yeah. 
And then we have <coughs> all the insects that Laura could find that grow with here. Here's just bees alone right here, you see. Mm -hmm. Then we have... Uh, so I'm looking at three-quarters of a page of just insect relationships. Uh, oh, yeah. Amorpha. Okay. And then, like I say, except a plagiopnathus amorphi, for example, this little uh, plant bug, grows the only place we've seen that on uh, amorpha, just a very few places. One was at German Methodist Cemetery in Indiana. So just because we have the insect there doesn't mean it grows everywhere amorpha grows. Mm -hmm. And so, but what... It, you know, and That's good because it's part of the questions I'd like to discuss later. <laughs> yeah. It's just because you have the plant doesn't mean you get the insect. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. That's precisely good. the case. And, and she's actually witnessed that. What's that? Laura's actually witnessed. She's. Oh, these are all based on her specimens. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what's yeah. cool. She's amazing. Very cool. Laura, one of the ways Laura is such an incredible entomologist is because, like no other entomologist in the country, she knows the plants. Mm -hmm. She knows the plants as well as I do, mm -hmm. and so she can tell what these insects are really growing on. Mm -hmm. And also, it, over the gray, over the fly, over the flying season of that particular bee, say she knows which plants it goes to, wow. you know, and and, and and the order in which they go mm -hmm. to. So she's not just witnessing. Oh no, no, she, not. she she understands. Oh, if you know, the you see does. her notes. Wow. In fact, uh, many people think that these bees, for example, uh, uh, are flying randomly around just looking for pollen. No. <clears throat> what happens is in the, if you have like a, on a, a row of a, a, a colony of sunflowers, if that sunflower patch has burned, then you'll have as many as four or five different cohorts of sunflowers during the, a, a woodland sunflower, say, uh, Helianthus strivosus, all throughout the growing season of that, uh, I think different ones coming in time. And when those bees come out and hit it, they're, it's nothing random. Mm -hmm. They're moving their little bodies. Every little energy they use is designed to fit that flower array so they go to each one of those little flowers in a certain order. Mm -hmm. And each of the flowers has a certain way in which the uh, order in which the female and the male keep coming into view and in, into availability. Yeah. And so the bees, it's all choreographed. Mm -hmm. They're not wasting any this energy. Isn't just, it's just a random thing. It's just not a random thing. And so uh, what happens uh -huh. if, for example, you, I don't know if it's what you want to get into or not. Oh, but I, well, this is good because I think people would be interested in knowing everyone's out there randomly running around. No, like not, people shop. No, people no, it's randomly not, go running around. It's not like uh, <laughs> just hanging around at a hardware store looking at all the really cool nuts yeah, and bolts. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's what, but uh, it's, uh, they, you know, so let's say you didn't burn the woods that year. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so then the flowering is going to be much reduced. And so that bee, that, those bees that are working that, those flowers, that population is going to be, it's going, first of all, it's going, to be, it's going to be stymied by the fact that the flowers aren't working in the right order throughout their flying season, mm -hmm. and there are going to be fewer of them. Mm -hmm. And so that okay. population is going to suffer. So lack of burning, less flowers. Less, less the, the stress on the bee population. Mm -hmm. huh. And so, uh, so what That's happens when you get it, for example, in, in woodlands that are not burning today. There's almost no bees in them. Mm -hmm. And the woodlands that are burning annually have lots of bees. I mean, mm -hmm. Mostly they're remnant bees in the woodlands. And so, uh, I would, I would, that is to say conservative bees. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, anybody who thinks it, so what happens, what you often see in a garden where you see a bee or a butterfly working around, that's not really a population. That's just a very weedy bee, a weedy sort of butterfly that can handle that kind of chaos that goes in okay. outside a remnant. Yeah, so a garden is not really something, it's a different, it's a totally different it's situation. It's a totally different idiom. Yeah. And, the, and, and in fact, of the 550 bees we have, in, in, well, Laura's working on the, on the bees of what we call the Southern Lake Michigan region, you know, about 53 counties in the southern half of Lake Michigan and around, you know, Wisconsin, wow. Illinois, mm -hmm. Indiana, and Michigan, and I'm working on the lichens of that same region. There are reasons why we chose that region, but region, but uh, of that 550 bees, uh, less than five percent are are going to appear in a garden. Almost mm -hmm. all of them are confined to some kind of remnant. The reason is, well, there are probably more of the reasons than I can even begin to think of. But among the reasons is, outside of remnants, you don't have particularly remnants that are burning. That she goes to all the annually burned sites. That's where she's getting mm -hmm. all the insects. I'll tell you, I could tell you why if you want to know why that mm -hmm. is. But uh, but the, it's the annually burned systems that have all these flowers, that have all these mm -hmm. pollinators. And when you <coughs> when you don't have a remnant, you don't have that. It's like you're, you're trying to run, uh, you know, run an, an opera 
but all you've got is the first violin and the, the, the oboe stayed home and you've got you know <laughs> you've, you've got a you know you've got a timpani back there somewhere. Yeah. That's all you can all you got to work with. Yeah. There's your opera. Yeah, there's your opera. And either and if you grow up knowing only that as opera, you'll think that's that the best thing you've ever heard. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. it's better than you know, right. better than beating on a tin can. Right. You know. <laughs> I think that's when you get into gardening. Like some of the questions I have, because when I look at a garden, a garden is humanly created. I placed every plant. I chose every plant. I'm going to associate with every plant. So when I design a garden, I want to design so things live well together. But sometimes I don't know necessarily if I'm putting the right groups of plants in to be the best beneficial grouping for other things besides aesthetics. So sometimes I get people saying, geez, well, you need to use more native plants. You've got to put more native plants in. And I'm thinking, well, I've got, you know, when I total up everything I use, i got almost 60% natives, but there's a support system from grasses. I use a lot of native grasses. But I put herbaceous perennials in based on durability and lifestyle. And they, well, that's not good. They're not helping anything. Those aren't native plants. And I kind of think, well, I think there's got to be some benefit just to the root systems I'm putting in. And the one benefit for me is I'm at least attracting human beings. Because yeah. I, I need, I, 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 my designs are based on art and, and beauty, like an impressionistic painting. Yeah. So I mix native and non natives, but then sometimes it's, oh, geez, Roy, why don't you just use all natives? And you're not, you're not doing as much good as you could. And I think, geez, I must be doing some good. Well, I think you're doing pretty good. I've seen a lot of your garden through the years, but the problem with native, is people don't okay? So if it appears in our book as a as a as an all in all and not in italics, mm -hmm. then it's presumed to be native. Okay. But 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 just with the bees and the, and the skippers and the butterflies and things, they don't. If you play, let's say let's, they they don't grow in gardens. They not they're not adapted to grow in gardens right. because most gardens, most soils today in this region are so obliterated, so compacted, so nutrient either too rich or too poor. That there are very few native plants that really are adapted to that. Mm -hmm. So what you get, the only native plants you get volunteering in a garden, are, you know, things like three-seeded mercury and, uh, you know, common common, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, ragweed and that kind right. of thing. Ridgeron. The and kind of plants, Ridgeron annuals, yeah. the kind of things that grew in Indian uh, encampments, where they had a compacted soil, or where they had kitchen middens, mm -hmm. you know, or where they had other areas of excessive nutrient. And then all the other native plants were in the prairies and then the woodlands around. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are very, neat, very few native plants adapted to, if we ever uh, were able to manage gardens, let's say we had a good garden going for 70 or 80 years that, that, that started nurturing the soil yeah. and bringing back the kind of uh, soil moisture and soil temperatures, uh, stabilities that, uh, that you would get in a remnant situation, there will come a time when perhaps we'll, have, we'll be able reasonably to expect some native species, some more conservative native species, to begin to not only uh, grow there for a little while, but sustain uh, for a yeah. while. But we, have, but we have to find some way to uh, aesthetically and meaningfully uh, readdress the depleted soil problem or the, or the, uh, or the problem of uh, soils with exaggerated nutrients mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. And so in a way, the, the garden the gardening that I know you do and very few others really, really do is, is an attempt to start that long process of developing a relationship with living things in the landscape where we live, mm -hmm. rather than defaulting everything to uh, uh, boxwood and red lava rock, yeah. you know, yeah. because it's easy to take care of and you don't have to do anything to it. And if they die, it's no big deal if you just hire the contractor to be four come back or five and years to again. redo yeah. it or whatever. Yeah. And, Maybe somebody come and take the, the masks and the McDonald wrappers out from under mm -hmm. the, the water. But uh, so having a garden that's aesthetic and beautiful and is at the same time beginning the, this long process of trying to restore a, a salubrious situation for native plants to grow. So, so I think when when I look at <coughs> when we look at putting plants back together, I look at putting just by native, non-native, or good hardy perennials. It's a good direction. It's a good beginning, I think, oh, to, sure. to have something healthy. Yeah. But I know you were talking about, uh, so because there's so many ways people improve. There's a million ways, it seems like, to improve soils. Some people use mushroom compost. Some people use peat moss. Some people have compost teas. And, and, I think they're, and I think they're probably all beneficial, but they seem beneficial based on what you want to grow. 
you're like a tomato, if you're growing a tomato, a mushroom compost might be more beneficial in a short period of time for an annual garden or something. That's right. But it doesn't mean it's really healthy soil no. moving into the future. No. What makes the soil healthy in the, in the temperate zone uh, of the world, all over the world, where you have plants growing, you know, uh, in the temperate zone is the... So when you, is, when you have the fine roots of grasses or sedges that are like, like capillaries in your tissues, are, mm -hmm. are everywhere they're in there, they're taking oxygen to and CO2 away from every cell in your body. And so in a real soil, you have the fine roots of grasses and sedges that completely turn over every three years. Mm -hmm. Very fine. The cons we... The whole percentage the of The whole roots. percentage. Wow. It turns over every three years. Mm -hmm. And those fine little roots, what are they doing in that soil? And they're, they're dying. Mm -hmm. and, and then they, 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 they decompose and leave a little organic matter all throughout there. And that organic matter, you know how in a green, in a room comp, uh, in a, a worm composter, you're, there's a tea at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So what, what that is, is like when you breathe out of your nose, it comes uh, moisture. Mm -hmm. So when everything, when anything oxidizes or decomposes, uh, such as in a worm composter or a mulch pile, that tea at the bottom is a result of that CO2 and water that's produced from oxidation or decay. And so in a, in a healthy soil, what's constantly going on throughout that soil is, is basically tea production. Hmm. And as there's also CO2 production. And the CO2 dissolves in that constant water, all, the tea in there, which, make, which lowers the pH and allows nutrients to be taken up in, in a, a, otherwise, you know, a soil that hmm. needs that kind of, uh, that, that the roots be that, that kind of... Uh, chemistry environment to take up nutrients. So it's uh, whoever thought this up really was a genius. <laughs> uh, but, but that's where, <laughs> but that's how it all works. And then, of course, the beauty of having tea, if you will, I'm using the word tea, you know, yeah. in, a, in a metaphorical sense, but it's when well, that water, <clears throat> moisture is throughout that soil. What you then have is a connection about 25 centimeters down with the, with the average daily temperature. So you have this, it's like you have a heat pump, but all that water is connected to it that nothing at the surface can get too hot or too cold. Mm. And so that's the beauty of it. And so what happens in a growing season, like right now, things are just starting to feel life coming back to them, yeah. is that, 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 that you, you, the, the, the soil temperature will slowly change in a healthy system. It slowly work up to about, the, by the time you get to September, where the average is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you're average soil temperature in a healthy prairie soil is probably around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. And then it starts going slowly back down. And the importance for the slowness, the importance of this gradual uh, uh, change of temperature is because all plants are ectotherms, just like insects and fish, you know, they're, they're yeah. ectothermic. And so they can't, having their, they can't have their metabolism constantly exposed to different temperatures that are changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so this makes a very, very healthy environment for all the living things in there, the, the, the fruit, the, the protozoans that are also important in the soil, the, the, the roots of the plants, the, the bees, when you have a healthy soil, uh, the bees that are most of all, are, are most of our native bees are soil nesters. So when you have a nice temperature range and that it's not changing, those bees that are, are having pupae and larvae in there, they can move up and down in there, their larvae and pupae, and they're regulate as, uh, as they need to as those pupae and larvae are developing. Mm -hmm. When you've lost that soil moisture, as any gardener knows, when you lose organic matter, you also, it, you, you, yeah. you know, you have a soil moisture problem. And so when you lose that soil moisture, <clears throat> let's say it drops below 50% soil moisture in your soil, depending on your soil, you now have a situation where you've broken the connection with the with the average daily temperature below, and that's like the heat pump broken. And so now that top soil can get exposed to excessive uh, heat and yeah. up from the sun or excessive cold. When it's moist, you can't get any lower than 32. And when it's when it's uh, when it's you can be you can be 100 degrees out, and it it'll still not change the top soil mm -hmm. the top of that water because. Wow. As things exist now, like when you look at our average cities and average suburbs and even some rural areas, how far is that system off? 
Oh, it's way off. Yeah. In, in, uh, Laura and I did a little study over at Clark and Pine, Indiana, which is a native, which is a remnant mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Dune and Swell Prairie, and in these swards of little blue stem, we were getting, uh, on a September day, I think it was about 72 degrees or so, we were getting soil temperatures in the, in the middle 80s, in the root zone of the little blue stem, out in the disturbed sand next, next to it, it was 110 degrees wow. on that day, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the only one living thing we, we saw in that sand, and that was this little ant, Proelius pruinosus, which is a very fast-moving ant, mm -hmm. and, and he, he can make it right across there, but they don't nest there. They'll nest in the little blue stem, mm -hmm. and, and uh, for the same reason that the bees. And so there are very few living things can grow in the soil that's constantly getting too hot or too cold. And so this is why it's so important that if we're going to create a habitat for a lot of native plants, this or, and bees and, mm -hmm. and things, and, and we need to have a healthy soil because I, I like to think of the soil as a sort of what I call that sweet interface between heaven and earth where life is. Mm -hmm. And if that soil is unhealthy, then all life associated with <coughs> it will be will be sick. And how? So when you see like a I call it our pedestrian landscapes, you know, you got turf, you got the trees and shrubs that you get for a certain amount of money, a discount or whatever. And there's, is, is, that, is any of that getting anything to a healthier situation or is that just keeping things at a lingering level? Well, as long as you water, you know, as mm -hmm. long as you want to live in water, the yeah. trees, if they get a drought, because it, in nature, you see, there was, in, the, in this part of the world, there was no, the word drought didn't exist east of the 100th meridian. And this, that, when we had healthy soils here, the, the area all east of the 100th meridian, which is in the Dakotas, down to Colorado, and east, it was perceived by those farmers at that time you would never need to irrigate mm. because the soils were so healthy. Wow. And so That's the, uh, but then, then we started, I don't know if you want to get into this, but then after Illinois became a state and after the War of 1812, this may be getting kind of off the subject, but it's kind of related, mm -hmm. is that the, the, because in our culture, the idea, what, what marked civilization was uh, tillage agriculture. This was defined, this is defined, we defined civilization, was those cultures that, that till the soil. And so it was Jefferson's idea and Madison's and others that we need, that we need to get farmers out into the hinter, hinterland where we just run the Indians out and and uh, get them farming. Mm -hmm. And so they were giving patents to uh, veterans of the War of 1812, 80 acres or so in, in southern Illinois, and throughout Illinois, you know, south of the Indian boundary. And, uh, but this, <laughs> the idea was that they would give it, they would, they could go there and then they could, I guess, sort of like a homestead, homestead act wasn't in 1862, but I mean, the, the idea was they could yeah. farm it. And, uh, and that, that would improve the soil, improve the economy, and, and help civilize the place. But that was the start of the decline of soils. That was the start. The reason was, it was as long as, so the problem was the soils of Illinois were too wet. When, when George Rogers Clark marched his army of the Illinois from Kaskaskia to Vincennes in February and March of, 19, of 1776 to, beat, to, to defeat the hair buyer at, you know, the, 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 English, uh, the English general, you know, at, Vincennes, he waded across the state of Illinois, he, he, 180 men, and he had a little drummer boy on his shoulders, <laughs> and he, they waded across the little Wabash, they waded across the, the they waded across the Wabash, <laughs> and in fact, if you go where they waded across the Wabash in 1776, you could drop a church in there and not, and not see it, <laughs> it's, it's so head cut down, and so, uh, beat up from the erosion, you know, and mm -hmm. down cut. And so the soils were too wet. So the, the government thought, well, what are we going to do about this? They have to give every farmer a fair shake. So they started ditching the prairies. And they tried to get the water out so the farmers could begin to till it. And they thought this was a twofer because at that time the doctrine of, a K, of, of, of contagion in medicine was that a disease arose from humors and miasma in the wet ground. Mm -hmm. So they thought if we drain the water out of the prairie, then we they would probably get a fair shake, plus we would obviate concern over a lot of disease. Mm -hmm. That was the thinking. And everybody thought they were doing a good thing. And now that's 
takes us right to today. It takes us right to today. Well, we knew it. That was just ditching. Mm -hmm. And then there was, uh, maybe I'm getting off the subject, but, but again, I don't want you to give back to today, but yeah. the point is, you have to sort of build the storm. Right. And so then they started, and then they tiled. When they ran out of ditches, when the ditches weren't working, they, then they started tiling. And so, but before they even started tiling, in 1874, Amos Sawyer published an article in the Transactions of the St. Louis Philosophical Society in 1874, and the title of the paper was The Reasons for Climate Change in Illinois. <laughs> and he attributed it to what he called the aqueous agent, which we says when he does, because when he was a little boy in Illinois in 1818, they, every afternoon there'd be a little rain shower come over in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. As the waters from the prairie drew, went up oh, okay. and then cooled yeah. off, and he got up there and they made a little rain. Like when I was a kid in Florida, it was that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I went to Florida State, every you know, between classes, you had to carry an umbrella at a certain time mm -hmm. of day, otherwise, you was going to rain. Yeah. Well, that used to be the way it was in Illinois, but then he said in his lifetime, with the draining of the, the it had changed from those afternoon rain showers to much more stochastically occurring, or frequently, or uh, and much more violent storms. And so he attributed what he called the aqueous agent, which was the dewatering of the prairie. Mm -hmm. And so that was the beginning. Uh, and, then our, and then the people born in the modern day have no idea that it was that way once. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'll tell you, uh, at that time, a farmer in Illinois, he was in tall cotton, so to speak, although they didn't plant cotton. They, they, if they, had, they could get 50 uh, bushels on the acre. That was good. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. They were talk, that, was, that was just, think, yeah. but they weren't doing anything. All you do is plant it. Mm -hmm. And now they had to put a lot of drugs in, a lot of inputs, almost $800 an acre, just to get uh, what they had. When they, now they want 200 bushels an acre. Mm -hmm. They want to get 200 bushels to the elevator before the next guy does. Mm -hmm. And so you got people out there trying to, trying to farm as early as they can. Well, you to, they get they got kind of staggered. But anyway, the point is the whole, people have forgotten what the what the reality was of an original soil and the original where these native plants once grew, right. and so uh, now we think that well, just because uh, uh, these people who wrote this book call it a native plant, that must going to be do well in my yard. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just a, an unreasonable assumption, since nothing about our yard has anything to do with with Illinois. Well, a lot of things we plant, and uh, I mean the, so the soil everywhere I go, the soil there's something living there, so I I just assess what I see understand the plants and the weed population, see how healthy the weed population is, and I put plants in that have similar needs. Yep. So I try to match the needs of the plants I put in. And then what I do is I don't, I, I build the garden in stages. Yep. So as time goes by, I can keep adding and enhancing plants because the plants actually will support the next group of plants I put in a little better. And I still, sometimes I put everything in all at once I got too many plants that aren't doing well because they're just not ready to be there yet, or they're overwhelmed by the plants that are doing healthy. They're out competed, yeah. and so a lot. And then a lot of times I'm, I, I like. I mean, I pay attention to what people say, but I just haven't bought into the fact that I have to plant everything in native plants because I, 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 I one, I horticulture has a history to it. There, yeah. Horticulture is something where people did something not because they were making money, but they loved the beauty of what they found and how they placed things together. So it was more an art form than it was, like today horticulture is an industry. Yep. How can we hybridize something and keep selling more plants? Right. And I, I like to think of horticulture still as an art form yep. of how we take plants and create beauty, but I also think why can't we be healthy too? Yeah. You know, like, and I think we talked about that a little bit about uh, like at Yerkes, we're talking about healthy soils and pollinators, different ways of positioning plants together, yeah. native and non-native. So, I, like one question I get is when I'm cutting everything back, I leave all the plant material in the garden. But some will roll, you're cutting back too much of the hollow stem plants and you're killing insects. And I realize, well, maybe I am, but are, are they the insects that are that threatened or endangered? Because I have to financially look at, I can't go to people's homes and spend two, three days cutting back and leaving. At least not yet, until people are more aware of that as being a normal process. But then I think, if I'm leaving the debris, which is a healthy thing, 
And I've got the living and dying of roots, of, especially with the, I use a lot of native bunch grass, Sporobolus and uh, Schizacrium. That's a good thing. So I don't know if I'm making myself less uh, passionate. Should I go and start cutting all these things back? Or are these insects just appearing frequently in other places where I'm not threatening their life? And, and well, of the 550 odd bees, that's the last time, last number Laura gave me, that there are probably a, there are fewer than 20 that are likely to occur in a garden, and so the less than less than five percent of our native bees are going to volunteer in a garden. For one thing, they are not very they, they they fly around, but they're not really that agile, and so they tend to the conservative bees tend to grow where they've always lived in mm -hmm. the remnants because in part because those remnants provide that complex infrastructure that supports the whole life of the bee and the whole life of the bee population. Mm -hmm. So what you get in a garden are those that are, okay, so if you plant a garden, they, they, people say, well, if you plant native plants, you'll get native bees or whatever, native yeah. butterflies. Yeah. Well, if you plant, let's say you planted uh, a red plant and, and, a, and purple prairie clover in your yard, in your garden, you don't think that you're not going to get other conservative plants popping up next to them. No. You see? <laughs> so it's unreasonable to think that insects are going to do the same thing. Uh, so. Because insects, uh, and they are, they're all responding to the same phenomena that native plants are, that the, that the remnant plants are, these remnants. It's these remnants that contain the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And so one day, if you, if you, if you, if, if our, we as a people become interested in having attractive gardens that are also building the soil and making these things. Mm -hmm. One day, maybe, there'll be enough coalition of uh, healthy gardens to where if you work your way up near to a remnant, there might could be some movement, you know. Mm -hmm. So there would be a, a, you said movement or transition into the created garden from the remnant. For if the, if, but if it's you, a time factor. It's a time factor, it's a health plant, factor, and yeah, the soil yeah. factor. And, and also, even, even in very, Large prairies, for example, like the Harlem Hills over in Rockford, uh, beautiful prairie. You know, I don't know if you've been there or not, but uh, it's just gorgeous, and it a lot it has a lot of the same plants throughout. But there's a, a the particular bee that grows only uh, in this one square meter every year, yeah. the same square meter. It doesn't go outside that square meter, even though the perfect plants are all there. Mm -hmm. There's something about every place on the ground. We've noticed this, Laura and I have every square meter of earth is sort of, is, the remnant is unique to all of the square meters. Mm -hmm. We don't know why or how, but we know that when we run coefficients of similarity, 2C over 8 plus B, we find that the, the, almost the highest coefficient of similarity we get meter by meter wow. is 70%. So, so that, I got see this is my gardener thing. So in this meter, that B lives there and only there. Yeah, that's it. Wow. It doesn't go no. three blocks away. No. And it just stays right where it is. Wow. Huh. It's got interesting little habits. All these bees you know, Laura showed me, you know, where like a male bee will hang out, like under a, a ligule of, a, of, a, of an aster or something, mm -hmm. or whatever. And the females, you know, running all around, you know, you're getting to doing what she does to this, to these flowers on the top of the flower. And the males hanging out just under the, under, waiting for her to get there and then jump her, you know. Huh. But what will also happen is if another male bee comes in and starts to, to beat his time, he'll run him out. There's all these really cool things that go on when you have this infrastructure that supports the population right. and supports all these things. And so yeah, I get that. I mean, it, it starts. It makes starts making sense to me. It's like a community here. You, I mean, here you would if you have a Starbucks and the closest community is 40 miles away. They're not going to be a busy place. No, they won't be busy. <laughs> there's, there's just no people or surrounding communities. But no, and you'd have to. And we have cars. Imagine that these bees don't have cars. Yeah. And they, they. It's, the other thing is, just because they fly, and just because butterflies fly, they all don't fly like monarchs. You know, where they can fly long distance. Some of them just fly right around where they are. Mm -hmm. And they can't be wasting a lot of energy flying great distances. Now the honeybee can go a long distance. But the honeybee is European, and mm -hmm. that's what it's always done, it's, it's, gone, it's what it does, and it builds nests at least. So a lot of people that have been incorporating native and non-native plants and gardening for years and years, maybe adding more value, more diversity to their garden, 
they may live close to a modest remnant or something close to that where some of the bees would come in from a remnant. They'd see it, document it, then it might just, they, but it wouldn't live there. They, they might, if they're close enough, they might go there to, to gather pollen. Yeah. But it's not likely that a male bee would be looking out for a female there because that's just not what they do. Yeah. They don't go out looking for a female far away. They go like where they live. And that's, that's, think about it. If you're, if you're out, you know, you know, bar hopping, looking for, look, looking for action some night, you're not, you have to go to the bars where you know people are. Right. You know, where you know. Can't go sit in your own basement. You can't go sit in your own <laughs> right. basement or just like predict, you know, I'm going to go over to, uh, you know, I may not try Cedarburg or something like yeah. that. And see if it's, if you go know, all the way over to Cedarburg, you might not get very lucky. Mm-hmm. You know, right. you, might, you might do closer to home. Anyway, the, so they, they, the whole, the whole situation of design is a, it, believe me, it's like a choreographed thing. All these bees, hundreds of them, butterflies, plant bugs, all these things, they have this, they have this special way they do things. Mm-hmm. And it's not just flowers that they're pollinating. There's more to a life to a, more to a life of a bee or a, or a butterfly than just pollinating a particular right. flower. They have to have a whole other life infrastructure there. Mm-hmm. The soil, the way the whole population is put together, this is why they're all confined to remnants. And so, if, however, you know, if, so I would, I always make the plea that we have to preserve, our generation has to preserve the remnants. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, there's no hope for the future of, of having any more biodiversity than the weeds we have today and the few weedy insects that we have today. And I think, well, that, that, it's what you learn from and understand from. And, and then the other thing... And that's where the germ reservoir is. And, and with the way we garden, I think, like for myself in particular, I can get I can I can get beyond just aesthetics for myself because I'm trying I'm trying to really I'm I'm really understanding birds butterflies I can't name or I don't know them in great detail but I, I want to feel good when I put plants in the ground first I've got the living and dying of roots like the, the bunch grasses you mentioned I want to feel good that maybe in 90 years or 100 years if there's perfect perpetual guards if they keep that going and the soil is getting healthier and then I want to feel that if the soil is healthier maybe something can make a home there that couldn't make a home there right. 80 years earlier right so we're kind of, we're moving into something better but my but I can really understand you can't rush it you, you can't, can't have it. it happen tomorrow and that's a part I'm trying to figure out how do I share it in a communication with others because no matter how good you want something to be it can get better, but maybe not exactly as it was, but you, it can't happen tomorrow night. It'll never be exactly as it was, but if you can, just like no baby born in the womb today, it's like any other baby ever born or ever will be born, there's always a new baby, and if yeah. this baby's cared for and grows up in a healthy household and community, it'll be a unique, beautiful thing, part of the culture, but not, like none has ever been. Mm-hmm. This is the way, this is the way, all, that, that, this is the way it's always been. Yeah. You go into a remnant and you, because we've Lauren and I've done this, you go into a remnant and you sample it this year and you go back the next year and you sample it, well, it's kind of different. Mm. You know, it's just, it's just about the same as it was. It's not mm. the same place. And so it just keeps changing. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong. No, nothing some, wrong. Some, way, somebody destroyed something. Usually that's, that's just the way it, it, it lives. Uh, yeah, it's just the way it all like this. Yeah. It, it, it goes through a, a cycle of... of of youth, mm-hmm. you know, or the youth, you know, it, it, you know, it's just the way all things are. Mm-hmm. Look at, you know, it's, so I, I don't know how you get around it. I, I think that's the part, though, that, that people need to get kind of comfortable with the idea. You don't give birth to a teenager. You give it to a baby and you learn and you nurture it all the way up and you love it all the way through. Right. Right. So with, with you talk about an 80-year garden or 100-year garden, however long it takes, if that garden isn't beautiful all that way through, if it, has, if it isn't properly managed, if it isn't properly planted and, and enhanced in a few time, people are going to turn that garden into a lawn. Right. And then you've lost all that effort. Mm-hmm. And so it's really important that people... I think that's a good point when we talk about stewardship and management and care, that once you initiate a garden, like I say most times, that the only time a garden really starts, loses value is when it runs out of possibilities for people. Yeah. And then it becomes, it falls apart. Becomes an orphan. So yeah, yeah, an orphan becomes an orphan. So if you can keep possibilities ahead, and that's with the the 
understanding of what you're creating and the, the increased health of what's happening. Because I don't know anybody that doesn't want to be healthy. You know, I can't name one person I've ever met that looks forward to being ill. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to get sick and watch Andy and Mayberry all day on TV. Or <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just think everybody, so I, I can't imagine having that, not having that discussion with how do we create something moving healthy into the future. Right. And, and, and everybody who has their beliefs with native and non-native, I think that can all be shared. Not, not, well, you're not doing this, you should do that, or someone, I think by combining using natives, using good solid perennials, yeah. but there's an understanding of the time frame, and then some understanding of what not to expect right away. Because, yeah. like you said, if you put a morpha in, that doesn't mean that one insect up here will ever show up. It, if you're just in the garden, nothing will show up. Nothing. Except maybe a German wasp and yeah. maybe eight or nine different bee species that are weedy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it. But uh, even 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 the idea of putting a native in, this this comes this is part of the problem of people who have a written language, and we and we and we work we have we look to define words like native mm -hmm. and. Some people can say, well, maybe if it's in our book, and listed as native, it must be native, wherever I want it to be native locally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, native needs uh, more critical thinking when thinking about it. You know, what, what uh, the, I the, like what you just said. Native mean we need more critical thinking. Well, I could. Well, because yeah, this this yeah. goes. It reminds me of a story that uh, that Tecumthe, the great Shawnee leader, uh, who was the his father, well, he was a member of the Kispakota sect of the Shawnee, and he had an old, a younger brother, who went away to go, who named, he became the prophet, you know, during the war mm -hmm. of 1812. But uh, the, uh, but Tecumseh was the, was the great Shawnee leader and the, and the war leader of the of this Kispakota sect of the Shawnee. And he had an older brother, Chikpika, notably older than he was. He had a sister too, but I mean, he never met him. But, he, he was there getting these boat, these books on the flatboats on the Ohio, and he went to his he went to his older brother Chick. I said, "Look, Chick, because what the white man can do, he can hear what the next white man says, even when the lips don't move." Mm. Not only that, Chick, because he doesn't even have to be there for the man to, to read what the what the other white man said. And Chick, because said to comfort, this is why the white man's so confused, because he traps the words from out of the air. And he puts edges on him like he does the land that you can't see, but you can't get around him. You, 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 know, you, you can't, you can't say. You can't, you get stuck there. And, so, and it makes it hard for the elders to explain things. Mm. And he said, not only that, they come think, you can't look into the eyes of the man who wrote those words to see if he's been listening to bad birds. <laughs> and not only that, they come think, anyone can read those words, even though the elder knows they're not ready. This is why the white man's so confused. So when we take a word like native, and try to put edges on it yeah. that, that make it to mean whoever says this word native and my particular coterie of friends, that's what it's got to mean because we all got together at a bar one night and figured that's what it's got to mean. Right. Or, or some genius said that native is this, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. But it's just a word. Right. It, it, what's really sort of what you were talking about earlier is you look at the place, you look at the soil, what's, what kind of plants grow here? What are, what are, what are adapted to this soil? What are adapted to here? That way, and of course, a lot of plants, frankly, from horticulture, have been bred to, to handle those soils. Mm -hmm. Native plants weren't. The, the plants that were in Aboriginal dwarf prairies and timbers weren't bred right. to the soil. So it's unreasonable. People will often say, I've heard it said so many times, well, it's a native plant. It must be able to handle the local climate and, and be hardy here, you know, more than anything else. But Frankly, uh, there are a lot of European and Asian species that are far more hardier in our modern suburban, western suburban, and, and worn-out agricultural soils than most native species. Well, they thrive better in disturbance. They thrive better they, in that, they, in that whatever, they, the, whatever their habitat yeah, is. Yeah. Uh, there are plants that, uh, even weedy natives, they won't grow uh, in too compacted a soil, mm -hmm. and then and then some won't grow into that nutrient rich. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can tell you what's happened in my lifetime with the weeds that, that, uh, in our soils. When I was a, a very young man locally, what I would see growing in the gardens and in the old fields 
was amaranth, you know, and, oh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, not weeds, you know, like the you know, oligonum, mm -hmm. and Pennsylvania, and that sort of thing, and butter print, you know, and uh, and but those those soils still in those days, you walked into farmer's field, they still had some stuff to it, you yeah. Know? yeah. But now we're at a few percent in those agricultural fields, two percent organic matter, and so when when I was young, the Phragmites and the uh, uh, What's hard to miss you, Bulgaris, you know, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mugwort Mug were pretty much confined to the very industrial areas of Chicago and Gary, yeah. Indiana. And now our soils are so depleted and so industrialized that they are now everywhere. Mm. You, can, you can see mugwort growing in a garden in, in, in Elvers mm -hmm. or in, in Lake Geneva. Mm. And you can you can see Phragmites growing along every roadside. Mm -hmm. That's right. why even they, they were used to, in that, in that Phragmites that grows on the roadside. The earliest we've ever seen it, the first time it came into this region was 1967. Wow. Uh, and also, all, other than up until that time, all of the Phragmites we saw was the, was the native Phragmites americanus, mm -hmm. which was even rarer when I was young. Mm -hmm. Now the, the, the Europeans swapping it out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the whole soil situation changed in my lifetime. And it's become less nutrient rich, well, oh, I should say, it's become less less uh, fertile and sometimes too nutrient rich or, or too industrial. Mm -hmm. and so we're getting these weird things that used to be confined to the industrial districts are now everywhere. Mm -hmm. and so even that's changing. If we, we're going to have to find a way to have it redevelop a, a congenial relationship with the earth, with the soil around yeah. us, if we're going to have any hope that tomorrow we'll have a more beautiful and more and progressively more beautiful mm -hmm. landscape. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess there's, like I'm, I'm, I hear, I hear things. Like I don't know what I'm hearing about perennial wheat. Where you can, where someone's growing perennial. I should look more into that. In fact, all of you out there can look that up. I can't remember the name of it, but if you're curious about perennial wheat, I think it's Nebraska or Kansas. Yeah. And oh, that was the yeah. Yeah, and I don't know the name, but there's all these things that. It doesn't really directly West pertain Jackson's, to what I do. West Jackson and his daughter. Right? West Jackson, yeah. They're finding perennial wheat crops and and getting and getting material from perennial wheat that you can get from corn byproducts to make yeah. to make other material other than food. And they're talking about that being a future as far as soil improvement, deeper roots, perennial roots, not plowing, not replanting. Again, that's another show, or not even well, a show for me to talk about. Cause no, like, but it is a, it's a reasonable thing to think, but I actually yeah. personally think that uh, the best use of agriculture if you're going to, is, in the growing of food for people is very much like the Centurion Farm in Italy, which could sustain good soil and healthy food produced for the community for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And that is just basically real farming, where you're plants and animals, mm -hmm. you know, where you're putting manure back in every day, every mm -hmm. every year. Like prior to the 1940s. Prior to the 1940s. Before, before we get, well, mechanized agriculture started coming in, in uh, particularly after World War mm -hmm. One, because what was the government felt, felt like we needed to have industries that could tool up quickly to build build machines like mm -hmm. tanks and airplanes. So it was really pushed forward the idea oh, okay. of of having big farm equipment and production of mm -hmm. farm equipment, and then that led to uh, led to people having to, uh, for, for a while, they would share this farmer to farmer. Mm -hmm. But then after World War II, they really, not, they really wanted to, yeah. they didn't, this whole idea of sharing went out the window because it was too close to community or communism or cooperation. Oh, cool. yeah. You see, which were, yeah. uh, right after World War II, mm -hmm. were, were you know, you know, strange words. I mean, uh, unfriendly words. So our culture. I guess. So see history. How it plays such a role in what, yeah. where well, we're at and what we do. Well, then, so then the farmer yeah. needs to. He, he so he's into the bank for two hundred fifty thousand dollars for some big equipment. That means in order to make, in order to make, a money on his investment, he has to have more land and more acres to provide more. Uh, more income on the farmer, so he can pay. For, so the farms get bigger and bigger, and when they get so, so really, really, when they get much more than eighty acres, mm -hmm. the you you don't. There's no machine, and there's no way to put organic matter back in the soil right. at that scale, at the industrial scale. This is why our soils have dropped to two percent or less. Mm -hmm. 
is when you till, every time you till, you oxidize more in, in, in that amount. And so uh, what we need to do is get away from the commercial scale agriculture and get back to local food production for local communities. And this is a whole, I actually wrote an article on this. Uh, you can find it on the Conservation Institute. Red, Institute. Right. Conservation Let's Institute. talk about that for a minute before we're off. Talk about the, your Conservation Research Institute. This is something, uh, this is where Jerry works, what Jerry does. I think it's important to go onto that site and you can read more of the things we're talking about. And so would you yeah, there's, a, there's under essays and links mm -hmm. there. There's an article I wrote on food issues, mm -hmm. and it relates to these things. And I understand why Wes Jackson and his daughter now are, are into the idea of perennial crop, because it doesn't require tillage. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good thing, but the problem really at the end of the day is Whenever you take, whenever you, whenever you're taking a crop at the commercial scale, that's non-local. Now you're basically mining away nutrients. Mm -hmm. There's a point at which you're going to have to start finding a way to get nutrients back in. Mm -hmm. And so, also, uh, for example, the Waldsterben, you know, in Germany, where the the death, the, the, black, uh, the death of the forest, mm -hmm. the Professor W. H. O. Ernst of Free University of Amsterdam was studying this problem, and he discovered that what it was is after after a, a thousand years of, m of mining wood out, they had so depleted this of, of taking wood out, they had mined away the nutrients. So if they went over with an airplane and spread uh, nutrients back in, they'd get some the trees would fall off, they'd get, they'd get some action. But uh, what they actually uh, the German government, the only way you get money to study that, that subject was to blame it at somehow on the French or the Belgians uh, for sending dirty air into Germany and wrecking their forests. Mm -hmm. So they, they would have to, there's a whole other thing of the politics of how research gets funded. So mm -hmm. you'd have to put that into his grant proposals that he was going to find out how France and, and Belgium and Holland mm -hmm. are messing up German mm -hmm. uh, forests. Yeah. But uh, at the end of the day, of course, and of course, in the in the, in the uh, abstract, they would point to that, but in the real paper, where you actually read it and discuss what's going on, you get the truth. Mm -hmm. But uh, but but there there was a but there was a situation where just like if you were to take a, a, a perennial crop and you keep mining it away for whatever reason, you're going to be mining away nutrients. Mm -hmm. So the only way to really, I'm afraid, to go to is to cultivate food in, in our way is to do. And frankly, go back to where it was before World War One, where you had, you had farmers working the land. You know, mm -hmm. that, 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 that three Lutheran sons could help him dig it. You know, yeah. do whatever he did. And they'd and rotate, they'd yeah. rotate the crops, and you know, mm -hmm. get your pitchfork and move the. Move. Sometimes I think, and this is where I make up, I make up my success because I don't know if I'm successful of anything. Uh, it's. It's the it's when you mix diversity into a garden. Yeah. I don't you don't have a big block or fifty of these, fifty of that. Yeah. When you have diversity, and I think each each plant it has its own way of breaking down its own yeah. chemicals when it breaks down, so it's creating a benefit for all the other plants it's living with. And it's not like I'm I'm digging deep into this, you know, yeah. uh, but I just feel like oh, I think diversity has always been good to me. Yeah. You know, as far, but the other end of diversity is having the capability to care for it, yeah. and that's the other part we we have to look at the raising the level of gardening to a more a, a more knowledgeable of just caring for it. Yeah, caring for even, it. Even the native people prior to settlement, they had to burn the land every year mm -hmm. in order for it to stay healthy. They had to. They, they had to have all resources for life within walking distance, mm -hmm. and so they had to make sure that they managed the land to have all of the flowers, all of the, all of the necessary resources to sustain yeah. uh, all the people. And so even then, even in, in the entire Holocene Age landscape, prior just after the glacier, there were human beings living here caring for the land. Mm -hmm. They had to, and they understood why. And and well, they, I don't know how yeah. they understood why, but they do. They, they somehow. Somehow they got their elders got hold of the idea they needed yeah. to do what they had to do. I, I imagine they <laughs> they'd, they'd see an outcome from the burn. Wow, look at this! Yeah, we got all this. Yeah, I, I, well, I remember once I was with a, a Canadian ecologist in uh, Burlington, Canada, where the just north of Burlington, there the Niagara Escarpment you know, steps down, mm -hmm. and it had uh, old 
shade, uh, shade pruned oaks, but it was coming up underneath it were these young lindens and maples and ashes and whatnot that were kind of shading them out, you know, shade pruning them. And I told Eric, I said, you know, Eric, I don't understand. I, this, this place looks like it needs a fire really bad, but it, it wouldn't carry a fire. It's two steps, you know. He said, well, Jerry, you've got to remember it. There was a great Haudenosaunee village up here from time beyond mine. We were moving enough wood for a Canadian winter for cooking and eating and building things. They were harvesting those woods on a regular basis. They were harvested so there was mm -hmm. enough light for all the women's plants, mm -hmm. but, but never so much. Uh, uh, but, but, and they would never took out so much wood that there would be too much light. They, they, they knew what to do. Yeah. This, yeah. They, they, so everywhere people have lived, they, 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 they had developed a way of living with the land where they were. Right. And this is, whether you're in the Amazon, or New Hampshire, you name it, you, you, you look at it. makes sense, right. It's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so, in, and then what people, like what Joe Margo has always talked about is, is that people will care for things that are beautiful. And so, and people like to care for them, and then they, and, and so beautiful things, they like, they like to make beautiful things, and then beautiful things are cared for. Mm -hmm. So if we have gardens that aren't beautiful, if we have just a, a big splash of echinacea, palette, which is for three weeks, looks kind of great, but it's kind of like rock music, you know, with only three, with, with only three chords. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this, it's yeah, There's a moment, and it's there's done. There's a over, and then yeah. it's kind of ugly. Yeah. yeah. So diversity is... How you it's how you how you achieve beauty all through the growing season, right? And even into the autumn and the in the winter, right? So with, with foliage, and so how you I know you're extremely good at, at how you choreograph that, you might say. Well, that's, but, it, I uh, keep learning from other people. I see what like Pete Outoff. Here's what he's doing, and he has his own way of projecting his styles, and still he projects his styles yeah. with the understanding it has to be cared for. Right. That's always the key. Is, is the caring for it. And that's been that's ever since I've known you. That's been your mantra. Is in fact, your one of your first books was no uh, no how to, uh, no uh, no maintenance no maintenance K N O W K N O W yeah. maintenance <laughs> because people often said I've heard this. You may maybe people don't say it today, but I remember back in the uh, uh, 80s, people were saying, well, if you have native plants in your garden, you don't need to maintain it because right. you know, and that's ridiculous. It'll look ugly as thin in a year and a half. It won't look ugly. And then you know, somebody's going to say, well, we've got to mow that. You know? mm -hmm. But uh, so everything needs to care. Right. Everything needs to be, your, your family needs to be cared for. Yeah. Your yard needs to be cared for. Your, your car. Your, everything, your, everything needs everything. to be cared for. There's nothing. One guy put through something in front of me. He said, this doesn't need maintenance. He, I go, what could that be? He said, a landscape boulder. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> okay. I can't, I guess you're right. I um, Well, Jerry, I think we've covered a lot. Yeah. And I appreciate you being here. I oh, think you're we've welcome. touched Always on a some, yeah. a, a lot of diverse things about everything. And thank you out there for giving us an opportunity to share this with you. And I want to show you again Jerry's book, uh, Flora of the Chicago Region. I think it's, it has tremendous value. I mean, I, when I first saw it, it was those relationships that I started using, seeing what lived with other things to help me create patterns and understand how I can create, I, I always want to say good design. Um, well, thanks, Jerry. You're welcome. This has been too good. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Thank you.